surrender is a scary word. Um, if you're anything like me, your heart moves every time you hear it because you're aware of all that is in you or in your life that might need to go, to leave, to, to be tossed up towards heaven and given back to God. Surrender ain't a new word, though, or a new concept, should I say. In Genesis, you have two people that God created. You have Adam and Eve who were made in the image of God and thus for his glory, who by virtue of their perfection at a time lived in a continual state of surrender where their bodies and their lives were always his. And by his, I mean God's. They lived for him until the serpent showed up. The devil didn't try to delete the concept of surrender, however. He didn't tell them that they shouldn't surrender at all. All he did was put them in the position to surrender to something or someone other than God, where their bodies and their lives were given over to the glory of a created thing. Through temptation and deception, they were willing to sacrifice their entire selves on somebody else's altar because they stopped believing that God was the worthy one. And this same reasoning is in all of us. And that's why surrender scares us. Because we think that if we give up what God is telling us to give him, if we hand over that thing that means too much to us, if we just decide to stop bowing at the foot of the idols of our own making and stand on our two feet for once, we reckon that surrender to God is somehow the practice of relinquishing our, our joy. That is an ancient lie. Because what it says is, is that once my hands are open and empty, that God is not big enough or good enough to fill it up again. Our fear of surrender is really our unbelief that God is better than everything God is telling us to give us. In 1 Samuel, there is a woman named Hannah. Hannah is married to a man named Elkanah. He is also married to another woman named Peninnah. I would not follow if his, in his footsteps if I was you. Uh, Peninnah had children. Hannah did not. To us, this might seem like not too big of a deal. If, if anything, in our day and age, it might sound like a blessing not to have several babies and all of that. But Hannah is in a culture where to not have children is seen as being cursed by God. If you know the story at all, Hannah is provoked often by Panetta, often because of her infertility, to the point that Hannah is depressed and vexed, as the scripture describes her, because she wants something so bad, but no matter what she does, she can't seem to obtain it. Not only that, but the Bible doesn't indict her body as the reason for her infertility. It puts all the blame on God. It said that God is the reason that her womb is closed. This season that Hannah finds herself in is due to the heavy providential hand of God. So Hannah may be sensing that if God is the reason this is happening, then God is the reason this can change. She takes herself into the temple and cries out before this God. In her prayer, she asks God to give her a son. You'd expect that's where the prayer would end, that it would just land on a petition. But she follows it up with an even crazier prayer, one of which isn't a petition, but a promise. I'm going to read it. It's 1 Samuel 1, verse 11. Oh, Lord of hosts. Notice she begins her prayer not with the problem, but with the person she's addressing this prayer to. Oh, Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall touch his head. I'm going to read it again, but with reflections this time. O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant. And remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord. Do you hear this craziness? She has just asked God for the thing that might end her distress. 
for the thing that might give her joy in her body and peace in her home. She has year after year been provoked by Peninnah for not having the ability to have a child. She's been depressed because of it, sad, because of it, vexed, because of it, and every other adjective used to describe somebody that ain't happy. But now, all of a sudden, the one thing that she has always wanted, she is more than willing to give right, right back to God. Why? What is in this woman's heart that would give her the audacity to do such a thing? To relinquish what has always meant so much. This is what happened. This is the secret to surrender. Hannah got to the point when she was no longer worried about what she thought she needed but became a person who was satisfied in the God that she already had. How do I know? Because in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, she prays again and she says this sentence. She says, my heart exalts in the Lord. What does it mean to exalt? To exalt means to have joy, to be happy. That means that her heart was not happy in a child. Her heart was not happy in what she wanted, but her heart was happy in who she had, which was God. You will give God anything when you believe he's everything. And Hannah, Hannah is not the only one who did the same thing. There is a man named Jesus who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself because his God, his father, was everything to him. There is a king named Jesus who took on the form of a servant because his God was everything to him. There is a God named Jesus who was born in the likeness of men because his God was everything to him. There is a creator named Jesus who being found in human form humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death because his God was everything. Jesus didn't have nothing to lose but his life so it ain't no sense in you trying to hold on to yours. There, there are surely a bunch of particular things that you may sense God telling you to let go of, like morality, arrogance, greed, isolation, apathy, whatever. But the primary thing God wants you to give up is your life. Paul said it this way. He says, I submit to you, I urge you, brothers, and sisters, by the mercies of God, the mercy being the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ that has made a way for us all not only to have eternal life tomorrow, but a victorious life today. I submit to you by the mercies of God to surrender your body and your gifts and your money and your relationships and your time as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God because that is your worship. I know we don't want to lift our hands sometimes, but that's okay as long as God has your life that's all the song you need to sing I know it's scary it's scary it's terrifying but there is nothing in your hands that God won't replace with more of himself so you can let it go you can you can let it fly you can you can let it burn God is better anyway it might hurt it might suck. I've let go of a lot of stuff and don't none of it feel good to let go of. But you might have to sacrifice some stuff. You might have to confess some things. But on the other side is God. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have him more than anything because he's better than everything. I'll preach a little bit more later.